Good evening and welcome. We're so glad to see so many here tonight. And just uh, for those of you who may be new to the ASA, I'd just like to kind of give you a very brief overview of, of what our organization is all about. We're a nonprofit organization that was established in 1941. And we're an organization of Christians who are either working in the sciences or interested in the dialogue between science and faith. We have about 2,000 members and an, an additional 3,000 uh, friends and followers. So our audience is about 5,000. Uh, we have members scattered across primarily the US and Canada, but also in various places around the world as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to proceed to uh, introducing our um, very uh, prestigious guest that we have with us tonight. And my first introduction to Dr. Kenneth Miller's work was way back in about 2000, uh, when one of my university colleagues introduced me to his uh, popular book, Finding Darwin's God, A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. And that book was my first serious introduction to the concept of theistic evolution. And in reading it, the anxieties that I'd carried with me all the way from my very first junior high biology class, uh, the fear that maybe modern biology was at odds with my Christian faith, those fears and anxieties finally began to fade away. Uh, so here's a bit more that you might like to know about tonight's plenary speaker. And one of these things I just learned a few minutes ago, and that is that uh, Ken is actually an avid sports enthusiast. And so uh, being a sports enthusiast myself, I've been trying to twist his arm to sticking around for tomorrow's softball and volleyball games, although I'm not sure I've been successful. Um, maybe by the end of the evening he'll change his mind. <laughs> we can only hope. Um, but Dr. Miller is a professor of biology at Brown University. After receiving his PhD from the University of Colorado at Boulder, he was an assistant professor at Harvard until 1980 when he moved to Brown University. He's a life sciences advisor to the NewsHour on PBS and co-author of the nation's leading high school biology textbook. In addition to his research work in cell biology, he's written extensively on evolution. He's the author of several popular books, including the one that I just mentioned. His honors include the Public Understanding of Science Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Stephen J. Gould Prize from the Society for the Study of Evolution, the Gregor Mendel Medal from Villanova University, and the Latar Medal from Notre Dame University. In 2015, he received the pre presidential citation of the National Science Teachers Association, and in 2017, the St. Albert Award from the Society of Catholic Scientists was given to him in recognition of his contributions to science evolution and the public understanding of science. He's been outspoken in explaining and defending the theory of evolution and its consistency with the Christian faith. And we're honored to have the opportunity to hear from him tonight on Darwin, God, and Design, Grandeur in an Evolutionary View of Life. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that generous introduction, and I'd like to thank uh, ASA for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, I've been here since Friday afternoon. I've interacted with a lot of you, and I've enjoyed those interactions very much. So it's a genuine honor to be asked to be your speaker this evening. Um, when one gives a talk, you never know how you're going to be introduced. So I always like to bring my own introductory slides so I can tell you who I really am. Um, I'm a cellular biologist. My main research tool is the electron microscope. I publish in journals like Cell and the Journal of Cell Biology, which I used to edit. Um, and uh, in preparing uh, for tonight's talk, um, I decided I would spend a lot of time uh, in appropriate gear to connect with the members of ASA. And due to a little glitch, you've already seen the picture. Uh, but here it is. 
Um, I umpire fast pitch softball uh, all the way up to the collegiate level, Division I, and the certifying organization, until it changed its name last year, was the Amateur Softball Association. <laughs> so you can see me sitting up there in my ASA gear. And the very first time I came to these meetings, which was quite a long time ago, I actually wore my umpire hat with ASA on it for a point of, point of conversation. Well, what I want to talk about tonight, as you know, is evolution. And in the middle of the 19th century, Western civilization got a bit of a shock. And prior to that time, you might say, we had a story. And you all know what the story was. Whether it was taken literally or figuratively, it was the story in Genesis. But the story in Genesis had actually begun to break down little by little until it received a body blow in 1859. And that was with Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. Now one of the things that's remarkable about this book is it's still readable today. And there are very few works of science written more than a century and a half ago that are actually worth reading in the present time. But The Origin of Species actually is for its scientific content, but also, I would argue, for its literary flair, and also from some insights that Darwin himself gave to it. And he realized that he was supplanting an earlier story. So here you can see one of the things he wrote. And he said, to my mind, it accords better with what we know, you might say, about the creator, that the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes, like those determining birth and death. And then he says, when I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of a few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled. Now that was Darwin's plea. But I have to say, and you all know this, that the reaction of many people in the UK, in, 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 in Europe, and in the United States was to take that word ennobled and basically put an ironic twist on it, saying it's not ennobling at all to believe that our species had as its ancestors a lesser, uh, a lesser organism, a lower form. And in fact, in the United States, um, this conflict between the old story and the new became a matter of law in several American states. The most famous of these, by happenstance, was the Butler Act in Tennessee. And the text of the Butler Act is shown here. It should be unlawful to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Now this led, as you know, to a trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925, the very famous Scopes trial. Unfortunately, most people in America are actually not familiar with the details of the Scopes trial because in the collective memory that's been displaced by a drama, by a play and by a movie called Inherit the Wind. And Inherit the Wind is really only loosely based on the Scopes trial. There are some substantial differences. The actual trial featured as advocates for the opposing sides two of the most prominent people in the United States, Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and it was an extraordinary trial. And if you look at Inherit the Wind, you will assume that the creationist side was thoroughly discredited and America went on to embrace science. Um, but that's not actually what happened. What actually happened was John Scopes was convicted. Although his fine was set aside, teaching evolution remained against the law in Tennessee and six other states. And that was true uh, right up until the time, right up until about the time that I graduated from high school. So it was actually illegal to teach evolution in several states. And all of that changed uh, in 1965, when this young woman, Susan Epperson, a second year biology teacher at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and those of you who know American history, know that Central High School in Little Rock has produced more than its share of American history. But here's another piece of that. And that is the high school got new biology books that year. And Susan dutifully submitted her lesson plans 
to her department chair. The department chair came back, and this is firsthand from the mouth of Susan Epperson, and said, Susan, you've scheduled a week to cover the chapters on evolution. He said, I don't care, but teaching evolution is actually against the law in the state, and I don't want to lose you. I don't want you to get in trouble, so please take that out of your lesson plan. Now imagine a second year teacher doing this. Not only did she defy her supervisor, but she filed a lawsuit against the state of Arkansas. With the help of the teachers union, she won that lawsuit in district court. The state appealed. The state attorney general showed up in person in front of the state Supreme Court to argue for a reversal of that decision. The state won, so the law was upheld. Susan then took it to the Supreme Court of the United States, and by a near unanimous decision, Epperson versus Arkansas, the law was vacated as an offense against the First Amendment of the Constitution. So Epperson versus Arkansas is the case under which all of the anti-evolution laws of the United States were thrown out. Now, as you'll hear, many years later, I was involved in a couple of trials as well. And uh, especially in the second one, I got tons of email because my appearance at the trial was highly publicized. And I tried to answer all of them, even the nasty ones. And as I was answering them, I got an email and it said, Dear Dr. Miller, thank you for what you did. I read your book. Um, I'd really like to have you autograph it if I mailed it to you. I said, yeah, sure, be glad to do that. And then she said, the author said, I think I know some of what you went through because a number of years ago, I was involved in litigation against the theory of evolution too, about the theory of evolution. I thought, who is this? And I go to the bottom and it says, Susan Epperson. And I couldn't believe it. And I wrote back to her and I said, of course I'll sign my book, but I have one non-negotiable condition. And that is you gotta send me a signed picture of yourself that I can hang in my office. Because as far as I'm concerned, you are a rock star. So about two weeks later, I get a package, and my book is in there, but along with it is this photograph. And I looked at that, and that pretty young girl, obviously is Susan Epperson, but she's sitting at some sort of a banquet table with a really old guy. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, what, once you reach that age, all old guys look pretty much the same. No offense, no offense to anyone in the room. And I wondered, who is this? And I turn the picture over. And gently written on the back is, this is me and John Scopes. And a chill went down my spine. John Scopes was not in good health, but he lived just long enough to see this courageous young teacher invalidate the law under which he had, in fact, been convicted. So it was an extraordinary thing. Now, I've already told you I'm a cellular biologist. I work with the electron microscope. What am I doing having anything to do with evolution? Here's the reason. It's 1982, um, sitting in my laboratory. I am in a great mood. And the reason for that is I am coming up for tenure in two weeks, and my laboratory has just gotten the cover story on the journal Nature. And I made absolutely certain to buy extra copies of that issue and distribute it to everyone on the promotions committee so they could see it, so I was a very happy guy. Um, then my telephone rings, and it's actually from a former student named Joe Levine. Joe is teaching at Boston College. And Joe says, how'd you like to help me write a high school biology textbook? And in my best wise guy New Jersey response, um, I rejected it. I said, what are you nuts? You know, go away. You know, I'm at a research university. I'm coming up for tenure. Writing a textbook is like zero credit. You know, I want absolutely nothing to do with it. But Joe, bless his heart, and I will not go into this because it would take a long time. It took him six months, but he convinced me to do this. A mere eight years later, uh, our very first textbook appeared. And um, it was aimed at the high school audience. It had a very strong treatment of the theory of evolution, of course, a very strong treatment of cell biology and everything else. And it was an interesting exercise, because I had no idea what it was like to write a textbook. I live in the town of Rehoboth, Massachusetts. In that town, I've already mentioned my involvement with softball. Uh, for six or seven years, when my kids were little, I was the, the kind of like the commissioner of the girls' softball program. I would run the spaghetti suppers to raise money. I coached one of our all-star teams. So they all knew me as a softball guy. But nobody actually knew what I did for a living until Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School adopted that biology book. And my name was on the cover, and my picture was inside. So about a month into the school year, I'm driving up to the high school, 
and there's a woman I know from softball. Her name is Bonnie Kelly. She's another coach, and she sees my pickup truck, and she flags me down. And I roll the window down. I say, hey, Bonnie, what's up? And Bonnie goes, Ken, Ken. She's very excited. You wrote the book they're using in the high school now. And I, you know, what do you say? I was very proud. I guess I puffed up my chest a little bit. And I smiled, and I said, yes, Bonnie, I did. And then she looked me straight in the eyes, and she said, you know, the funny thing is you don't seem that smart. Uh, <laughs> So as I say, funny things happen to you when you write a textbook. Um, the other thing is horrible things can happen as well. And one of the horrible things is the textbook can be successful. And if it's successful because of the changing nature of science, five years later, you're going to write another one. And five years later, you're going to write another one. And then you're going to write another one. And then you're going to write another one. And some of the younger people in this room may have had the misfortune to be educated using, in fact, one of these books because they've reached all over the country. Now, what does that have to do with me speaking about evolution? Um, I thought writing a, a textbook for high school kids on science was a pretty uncontroversial thing. Boy, was I wrong. And we found out very quickly that having a strong treatment of the theory of evolution in a textbook brought static, and it brought it from all over the country. And I want to give you one example. Um, as it turns out, um, the good people of Cobb County, Georgia, or I should say their teachers, picked our textbook to use in the 13 high schools in Cobb County. I was very grateful. That was about 3,000 books. But the school board in Cobb County, in their wisdom, noticed that the book had a unit on evolution. And they thought their students needed to be warned about the dangerous topic that was inside. So this is an actual copy of the warning sticker that was slapped on our textbooks, kind of like on a pack of cigarettes. And you can see this textbook has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. The material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And I still remember that a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution called me up and interviewed me about this. And she led with this question, Dr. Miller, Aren't you outraged by the sticker they put on your textbook? Now, I'd been interviewed before, but I never had a reporter put a word in my mouth like outraged. And he asked me to agree. And all, all of a sudden, I thought, oh my goodness, I can imagine the headline over her story tomorrow in the Journal Constitution, which is author, out, no, northern author outraged <laughs> over the way his textbook is being treated. And I decided I would have some fun with her. And I said, no, I like the stickers. She said, you do? And I said, I think the stickers are great. They just don't go far enough. And I said, she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the textbook has material on evolution. Of course it does. It's a biology book. And then she said, well, is evolution uh, a theory or a fact? And I said, let me put it this way. If a young person went to the University of Georgia and majored, majored in physics, they'd have to take a subject called atomic theory. Now, why do we call that subject atomic theory? Is it because it's just a theory that atoms exist? No, of course not. What atomic theory is, is a series of well-reasoned interlocking explanations that account for hundreds of thousands of experimental facts. And that's the point. Theory is a higher level of understanding, in fact. Theories in science don't become facts. Theories are used to explain facts. But I said the sentence that really gets me mad is the last one. And she said, you don't want students to approach with an open mind? I said, no, 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 here's the problem. What that last sentence tells students is that we are absolutely certain of everything in this textbook except evolution. And she said, so that offends you as an evolutionist. I said, no, it offends me as a cell biologist. Because to imply that we figured out everything in cell biology, everything in biochemistry, everything in ecology, we know it all for sure, that's ridiculous. If I figured cell biology was all figured out, I'd retire because there was nothing else left to discover. So that I said, I tell you what I'll do. No charge. I will rewrite the sticker for the Cobb County Board of Education. And this is my rewritten sticker. This textbook has material on science. Science is built around theories which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And that, 
And that's a sticker I put on the textbook myself. Um, as it turns out, they did not accept my very generous offer. They were sued by six parents of students. It went to court. Um, I actually flew down to Atlanta to testify. The principal plaintiff was Jeff Selman right there. You can look up the case if you want. Selman versus Cobb County. Uh, we won the case. Uh, my name appeared in the very first sentence of an AP story that was printed in about a thousand newspapers around the country, and you have no idea what my email inbox looked like the next day. Uh, uh, lots of people felt uh, obliged to write me and advise me on where I might spend eternity, um, <laughs> mentioning uh, no need for warm clothes where you're going, uh, and that sort of stuff. So it was an interesting experience. But as interesting as this was, this was just the lead into something else. And that is at about the same time, a school board in eastern Pennsylvania had decided to prepare a curriculum based on intelligent design. And they did this once again in reaction to their teachers picking our textbook. Well, what happened there was incredibly interesting. Um, and uh, one of my friends snapped this picture of the scoreboard outside Dover High School, it said intelligent design won Darwin nothing. And they asked me what I thought of that, and I said, well, as an old baseball player, I rather like it, because first of all, they made us the home team, uh, and second of all, um, that means we're gonna get to bat in the bottom of the ninth. And as you see, as you will see, uh, we did indeed get to bat in the bottom of the ninth. Uh, but indeed, this intelligent design curriculum was voted in. When the curriculum was implemented by reading out a lesson to students and by presenting them with a textbook called Of Pandas and People, it turns out uh, 11 parents went to federal court in Harrisburg and they filed a First Amendment lawsuit and they said this was an unconstitutional attempt to advance a religious idea under the guise of science. And not just religion, but a very particular religious idea. The case became known as Kitzmiller versus Dover. Uh, Tammy Kitzmiller, uh, right there in the pink blouse in the center of the picture, was one of those 11 plaintiffs. And you might say it fit the science versus faith stereotype almost perfectly. And I remember listening to National Public Radio in the run up to the trial, and the commentator said the following as the trial began, it's God versus science in a Pennsylvania courtroom. Now, I had the honor, and again, I don't think that's the right word, but I'll use it anyway, of being the lead witness for the plaintiffs in that trial. Uh, this is an article from Science in the Aftermath of the Trial. We had six expert witnesses, two of us were scientists. Um, I led off our presentation, the trial lasted for seven weeks by the way. I led off our presentation, at the end of our presentation, the last expert witness was the remarkable Kevin Padian from the University of California, Berkeley, who's a paleontologist. Uh, Kevin, um, I think, had the best line of the whole trial. It's one of those George Bernard Shaw moments where I wish I'd said that. And uh, an attorney asked him, why would you object to kids being taught intelligent design in school. And Kevin paused for a second and he said, because it makes them stupid. And what he meant by that was it tells them, don't inquire further. Don't wonder about the mutational pathway, the adaptations, the selective advantages. Just say it was designed that way. And that's the end of inquiry. And for any scientist, intellectual death is the end of inquiry. Well, what Kevin and I and other witnesses did was in effect to present a college seminar on the evidence for evolution to the court. Uh, one of my former students, and now a professor at Swarthmore College, incidentally, showed up one day with bumper stickers at the trial and passed them out, and that was his bumper sticker. We have the fossils, we win. Um, which I thought, you know, sort of was prophetic in terms of how the trial actually turned out. And what Kevin and I and the other expert witnesses tried to do and all the slides that I'm showing you here were actually shown to the court during the course of the trial was to concentrate on the scientific evidence for our common ancestry with other species. And I could go on and on about how many lines of evidence we pursued, but I want to mention one. And that is, although Kevin's a paleontologist, even he had to admit that these days the most telling evidence for evolution is actually found in the human genome. And just before the trial, this issue of nature came out and had it in it the complete DNA sequence of the chimpanzee genome. And the summary article for in that issue of nature read as follows. More than a century ago, Darwin and Huxley proposed 
that humans share recent common ancestors with the African great apes, modern molecular studies have spectacularly confirmed this prediction. And indeed, they had. So I told the attorneys, I want to come into court and I want to testify on this new, these new scientific findings. And they said, what are you going to say? And I said, well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to point out the degree of conservation of syntony between us and the other. And they said, wait a minute. The judge is an attorney. You have to put this in terms that are so simple that even a lawyer can understand them. <laughs> so, that was, so that was our challenge. And one of the most telling things that I pointed out based on this scientific work is shown here. There's something really interesting about the structure of the human genome. You probably know that we humans have 46 chromosomes. However, all the other great apes have 48 chromosomes. So if we share common ancestry with these guys, why is it that we're missing a pair of chromosomes? Did a pair of chromosomes just sort of get, tra get trashed in the lineage leading to us? And the answer is no, that's not possible. There are so many important genes on every pair of homologous chromosomes that the loss of a pair would be fatal. You couldn't even go through embryonic development. So the only possible explanation for that is the two chromosomes that are still separate in the other great apes at one point in the human evolutionary line got fused together to form a single chromosome. And that basically would explain why we have 46. Now, that's not evidence. That's just a conjecture. But here's why evolution is science and not simply hypothesis. If that's true, it's a testable prediction. So we can go into the human genome and see if we actually do contain, as evolution predicts, a fused chromosome. Now, how would we find that out? The tips of chromosomes have on them a very special repeating sequence of DNA known as a telomere sequence. So I've drawn two chromosomes up here, and the telomeres are colored in in blue. Also near the center of every chromosome is an equally special region known as the centromere. Now, if we carry around a chromosome that was formed by the accidental fusion of two other chromosomes, you know what it should look like? It should have telomere DNA in the middle where it doesn't belong, and it should have two centromeres. So now we can examine the human genome, and we can put the hypothesis of common ancestry to the test. And lo and behold, it's human chromosome number two. Everything I just told you about the architecture of a fused chromosome is represented in human chromosome number two. The two centromeres, the telomere DNA right in the center, and the authors even pinpointed the exact base where the fusion takes place. Well, the DNA sequences have gotten even better. And prior to coming today, I figured I would go into the latest builds of the Human Genome Data Bank. And what you can see here is human chromosome number two on the top of the slide. Underneath it are chromosomes from the chimp and the uh, orangutan, which we used to call in those species chromosomes 12 and 13. But now that we know that they match the two halves of our chromosome, these are now called chromosome 2A and 2B because they line up so perfectly. And you can see that in the color coding. More importantly, and again, here's the human chromosome with the other primate chromosomes underneath it, we can focus in on the fusion site, which I put in the red box, and we can look at the genes on either side of the fusion site. And the active genes, which are on both sides of the site, exactly match the order of genes on the ends of what used to be chromosomes 12 and 13 in the other primates. And we can go even further. We can go right down to the level of DNA bases, and we can find the exact point at which the two ends of these chromosomes bump up against each other. DNA sequences are not theories, hypotheses, or conjectures. They're facts. And therefore, the fact is our genome shows evidence of common ancestry with other organisms. And that's a scientific finding. Now, what Kevin and I wanted to focus in on was, in fact, the scientific evidence. But as you will see from this trailer from the NOVA program about the trial, made about two years after the trial was over, religion still figured heavily in the trial itself. Now, we had some problems with the audio here, so I hope it works this time. Oops. OK, I have to quit this and restart, and hopefully it'll work this time. Anova. 
I believe there is an intelligent design. In the beginning, God created. Saying that you don't believe in evolution is almost saying we don't believe that the Civil War ever took place in the United States. An extraordinary court case ignites a small town. It's like a civil war within the community, there's no question. And puts science itself on trial. Very important things were at stake. One is the future of science education in this country. Nova reveals the story behind the headlines. Anywhere you turn, we were getting attacked. Witnesses um, started dropping like flies. And probes the question, is intelligent design a scientific alternative to evolution? Properly the subject of a science class. Or religion in disguise? It's a violation of everything we mean and everything we understand by science. Judgment Day, Intelligent Design on Trial, on Nova. Uh, I, ho I hope that narration was dramatic enough for you. Um, it's, uh, it was an extraordinary program, and it won the Peabody Award for Broadcast Journalism. And it told three stories. It told the scientific story, the conflict. It told the story of the First Amendment. But most compellingly, it told the personal story of the conflict between the people on both sides of this issue in the small town of Dover. And it was a remarkably uh, moving piece of television. Well, how'd this turn out? Uh, it turns out, uh, December 20th, just before Christmas in 2005, the decision was announced. And the judge, a lifelong Republican, appointed to the bench by President George W. Bush, and I am hasten to add, recommended for the bench by then Senator Rick Santorum, in Pennsylvania, so this is someone with sterling conservative credentials, announced this stuff simply was not science. And this set off, uh, this was front page news on everything from USA Today to the New York Times. It was the lead story on all the networks that evening, and it set off celebration of the small town of Dover. Uh, because remember, it was 11 parents who had sued the school board. Now, the media continued to treat this as a science versus religion case. But in fact, it wasn't a God versus science case at all. The judge himself is an active member of his Lutheran parish. Three of the six expert witnesses, um, myself included, were people of faith. One of us is actually a professor of theology at Georgetown University, Professor John Haught. And this is important. Seven of the 11 plaintiffs were Christians, and two of them actually ran a Sunday school. So it, the notion that this is somehow an effort to get God out of the classroom, quite frankly, is bogus. Nonetheless, we see the impression everywhere in our society that faith is the enemy of science and reason. And you can see it in this cartoon where there's a candle in the darkness called science. That's actually the title of a book um, um, by Carl Sagan, Science is a Candle in the Darkness. And dark eyes are saying, hit it with your Bible. Um, part of that is because we have continued resistance in the faith community to the idea of evolution. There's a photograph outside a church in Florida, one of my friends sent me. Um, if man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? I can't tell you how many times I have been asked that exact question in public lectures at colleges and universities. So I've been asked it so many times I have a stock answer, which is I will say, sir or madam, I'll answer that in a minute, but first I have a question for you. Um, where did Protestants come from? And they always look at me kind of confused. And I say, come on, 95 theses nailed to the church door, Martin Luther, oh, oh, Reformation. I guess they came from Catholics. Good, are Catholics still here? And all of a sudden, they understand why there are still monkeys, which is Christianity split into branches, and the same thing has happened with the primates in terms of splitting into branches. But nonetheless, the popular media love that God versus science theme. Now, it turns out, unfortunately, a lot of people in the scientific community love it as well. Uh, this is an op-ed piece that appeared in the New York Times, <clears throat> pardon me, as you can see, called God, Darwin, in My Biology Class. It was written by David Barash, who's a very distinguished biologist at the University of Washington. And I want to show you what Professor Barash wrote. Every year around this time, with the college year starting, I give my students the talk. It isn't, as you might expect, about sex, but about evolution and religion and how they get along, or more to the point, 
how they don't. And he went on and he said, just many Americans don't grasp the fact that evolution isn't just a theory, but the underpinning of all biological science, something I would agree with, a substantial minority of my students are troubled to discover their beliefs conflict with the course material. The more we know of evolution, the more unavoidable is the conclusion that living things, including human beings, are produced by a natural, totally amoral process with no indication of a benevolent, controlling creator. So there's Professor Barash kind of throwing down the gauntlets to any students of faith who might happen to be in his biology class. Now it's fair to say that it is true that scientific concepts that seem to contradict the stories of the Bible, like evolution or for that matter the Big Bang origin of the universe, are troubling issues for many people of faith, especially for Christians. And to sort of document that, I want to show you a clip from another NOVA program, um, this one a bit earlier, called What About God? And those of you from Wheaton College may recognize parts of this clip. It's doing it again. Sorry. I'm going to restart. The majesty of our Earth. <laughs> the beauty of life. Are they the result of a natural process called evolution or the work of a divine creator? This question is at the heart of a struggle that has threatened to tear our nation apart. That's an outdated religious book. Science has shown you can't... For fundamentalist trust Christians you like Ken Ham, evolution is an evil that morality. must be fought. You can't hold up your moral hand. Well, I think it's a war. It's a, it's a real battle between worldviews. For embattled teachers in Lafayette, Indiana, evolution is a truth that must be defended. I think they think someone will come out a victor, and I don't believe that that's going to be the case. If you look at the Bible, if you look For at Christian the Bible, students at Wheaton College, evolution is an idea that is hard to accept. Where is God's place if everything does have a natural cause? For all of us, the future of religion science and science education are at stake in the creation-evolution debate. Today, even as science continues to provide evidence supporting the theory of evolution, for millions of Americans, the most important question remains, what about God? And I think for an awful lot of people, that is the remaining important question. So how can people of faith reconcile themselves to such ideas? Um, and um, there are a lot of ways to begin, but I thought I would take cosmology first, specifically the Big Bang. And I like to ask my students, these are biology students of course, if they know who first worked out the theoretical, the mathematical foundations of cosmic expansion theory, the Big Bang. And the most common guess uh, is Albert Einstein, because it turns out the general relativity actually predicts an expanding universe. But Einstein, for what you might call anti-theological reasons, wanted to believe in a steady state universe. So he rejected this idea. The person who developed it is shown in this picture. And Einstein, we know, was suspicious of him because he was in clerical garb. He, in fact, was a priest. This is Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian priest and a professor of physics and uh, uh, mathematics at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And Lemaitre was able to show, although it took him 20 years to convince Einstein, that in fact general relativity provided for an expanding universe. That means the universe will be larger tomorrow than it is today, and it also means it was smaller yesterday than it is today. And 100 years ago it was smaller still, and Lemaitre realized the implication was that there was a point in the past when the universe was infinitely small. And that is the beginning of what we call the Big Bang. A number of books have been written about Lemaitre. Uh, this one called The Atom of the Universe. Uh, another one much earlier, uh, much better, and more recently written by my friend in Massachusetts, John Farrell. Uh, and John quotes extensively from Lemaitre himself. He remained a priest the rest of his life, and he was frequently asked, how can you remain a priest and do scientific work on the Big Bang when it seems to contradict the Bible? And his answer was very simple. 
the writers of a Bible were related more or less on the question of salvation. In Lamatra's view, they got that right. On other questions, they were just as wise or as ignorant as others of their generation. So it is utterly unimportant if errors of historic or scientific fact should be found in the Bible, especially if they relate to events that were not directly observed by those who wrote about them. And needless to say, no one was there to witness the creation of the universe. And that was Father Lamatra's point. Now, it turns out that the media still professes shock and surprise when a religious figure endorses the Big Bang or evolution. And not long after assuming the papacy, Pope Francis said exactly that. He said, evolution and the Big Bang theory are real. Uh, and, the, and God is not a magician with a, who does tricks with a magic wand. It's also worth noting that Francis was trained as a chemist before he entered the seminary. And therefore, he is familiar with scientific matters. And I should mention to you that when Pope Francis said this, I was called up uh, by both Time and Newsweek and asked for my comments on this shocking revelation. Well, it turns out I told Newsweek this is not shocking at all. And they pretty much hung up on me because they wanted someone to say it was shocking. Time magazine, bless their hearts, they printed a story and they quoted myself and they also quoted uh, Brother Guy Consolmagno, who's the head of the Vatican Observatory, to say this is not surprising. This has been the position of the church for a long time. This newspaper in the United Kingdom got it right. His comments on the Big Bang are not revolutionary. They are in keeping with the intellectual tradition that produced scientists who were also people of faith like Georges Lemaitre. Now, let's go from that to evolution. What is it about evolution that inspires so much resistance from religious circles? Well, the answer is, of course, that it seems to upset the special relationship between us, the created, and the creator. Charles Darwin was aware of that. And it turns out that many people urged Darwin, uh, who was not a Christian at the end of his life, but nonetheless urged Darwin to condemn Christianity. And in particular, he received a letter from a gentleman known as Charles Fordyce, and Fordyce invited Darwin to declare that one could, po could not possibly be a Christian and accept evolution. And this is the letter back to him from Darwin. Now, Darwin was unfailingly polite in his correspondence. But this letter, in this letter, he uses the most blunt language you can imagine. And he starts off by saying, dear sir, it seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. So Charles Darwin himself said, that's a ridiculous idea. And then he went on to say the following. He cited Asa Gray, the eminent botanist. Asa Gray is an American scientist who should be way more famous than he is. He is, in effect, the founder of the modern science of botany in the United States. He was a professor at Harvard. He's responsible for the, the floral collections at Harvard, for lecturing throughout the country to popularize evolution. He's even featured on a stamp, the Heroes of American Science. And as it turns out, he also was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. So Darwin, who at that point was not religious himself, was perfectly well aware that there were, in effect, disciples of evolutionary theory who were devoutly religious, even if he felt he could not sustain religiosity himself. Now, that's not a 19th century artifact. That continued well into the 20th century. This is Theodosius Dobzhansky, the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century, responsible for many of our advances in understanding evolution. Uh, a number of years ago, he wrote a very famous article. And the title of the article says it all. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And in that article, he wrote, the diversity of life is reasonable and understandable. If the creator made the living world not by caprice, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. He said, it is wrong to hold creation and evolution as exclusive alternatives. And then he said, I, Dobzhansky, am a creationist and an evolutionist because the, the, the Theodosius Dobzhansky was a Christian. And he said, evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation is not something that happened in 4004 BC. It is a process. 
that began billions of years ago and is still underway today. Now, he's not the only religious person who was asked this question. Uh, Pope Benedict was asked the same question by the group, a group of Italian journalists, and he said, look, the contrast between evolution and creation is an absurdity. I love the fact that he used the same word Darwin did because there are many tests in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality that we must see and enriches our understanding of life and being. That's kind of bureaucratic, complex language. So if you're a bit confused by that, which I was, you should go to that publication that, for me, always clears everything up. And you know what that is. It's the New York Post. God and evolution do mix Pope. End of story. <laughs> so how do I look at this? Well, as a scientist, I look at it this way. Life is material. This is, by the way, this is one of the few things Madonna consistently got right. We live in a material world. Life is material, and the capacity for life is built into the physics and chemistry of matter. Evolution, therefore, is an inherent and predictable part of nature. If the ultimate cause of the natural world, as we believe it is, is the will of God, then evolution reflects God's creative power. So in a very real sense, there is an evolutionary design to life that is part of the inherent fabric of the natural world. So my lesson is the capacity for evolution, evolutionary change is actually built into nature. And that allows believers and people of faith to see it as part of God's providential plan. This is not a unique opinion of mine. This is also held by one of the world's most distinguished paleontologists, Simon Conway Morris, whose fossil work completely revolutionized our understanding of the Cambrian explosion. Um, he, uh, Simon has written a number of books uh, promulgating this thought. He is also a Christian. Uh, this one is Life's Solution, Inevitable Unions in a Lonely Universe. And Simon argued basically, and I would argue as well, that we do not need to find room for God in the evolutionary process, a place where God could tinker to make it come out just the way he wanted. And the reason we don't have to do that is because the process itself is part of a natural world of his own making. So a skeptics might say, what kind of God could exist in a scientific world in which nature acts according to orderly, predictable rules that can be studied and described and understood? And my answer is a God who fashioned a world that is rational and intelligible. So to people of faith, God is not the antithesis of scientific reason. Rather, he is the reason why science works. The reason the universe is comprehensible is precisely because it had an intelligent force behind it. Now, many of my students who struggle for this question worry about what they might call nature red in tooth and claw. The struggle for existence. Is that compatible with a merciful God? Well, existence is tough. You may have seen this painting before, uh, the work of Michelangelo, of course. But when I show this to academic audiences, they don't always understand it. So I explain it to my academic colleagues this way. Um, these two people once had what was the equivalent of a full professorship at an Ivy League university. <laughs> they were then discovered engaged in some sort of academic dishonesty. And this is the messenger from the office of the provost consigning them to leave the university and spend the rest of their lives toiling at the local junior college. <laughs> Please, no offense to any of you who do the great work that is done by our junior colleges around the country. But that's how I can get my friends to understand this. Um, but this cruelty of nature is thought to be a barrier for people of faith in terms of understanding evolution. Well, I always tell my students, I got news for you. And that is, all organisms are born to die. That's an observable fact. That's not an invention of Charles Darwin. That's the first point. The second thing is, in a material world, life comes only at the cost of death. And that is a fact and not an invention of Charles Darwin. And I once had a student put her hand up and say, not me, I'm a vegan. 
nothing dies so that I can live. And, and, and my answer is, I did my doctoral thesis on the photosynthetic apparatus of Spinacea oleracea, spinach. And I assure you that the chloroplast and the organization of reaction centers in the photosynthetic membrane is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. My estimate is, with every bite of the salad you had for lunch, you destroyed 50,000 of those beautiful things, and it makes me very sad. <laughs> so please don't tell me that nothing died so you could live. Plants are alive, and they die as well. And as a plant cell biologist, like I said, it touches my heart. But just as sin defines virtue, from the struggle for existence comes the evolutionary possibility of perfection. Is evolution consistent with the character of the Christian understanding of God? I would put it this way. The only alternative to an evolving world is a world that doesn't evolve, a world that is fixed, inflexible, and static. The message of Christianity, on the other hand, is one of possibility, of redemption, of human freedom. Values like that are inconsistent with a fixed creation in which the possibilities for the future are predetermined. And therefore, evolution, which is ultimately a science of biological possibility, is perfectly consistent with the Christian theology of spiritual possibility. Now, I want to show you a picture of my friend Richard Dawkins. And I say this because I do consider Richard a friend. He's always been kind to me. He's promoted my books in Great Britain. We've shared the platform a couple of times and I find him to be an honorable guy. Um, his best-selling book of all time is not about science. It's called The God Delusion. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And my advice to any person of faith who has not read The God Delusion is buy it and read it, because you should be able to deal with the arguments in there if you want to call yourself a Christian. Now, in a couple of his books, Richard has written this. The universe we know about through evolution has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. I shared the platform, as I mentioned, with Richard uh, a number of years ago at a conference in New York University. And we had a break, we chatted amiably, and then I recited that quotation to him from memory. And I said, Richard, how do you manage to get up in the morning if that's what you think the universe is like? And you have to imagine, because I can't do the accent, the best Oxford accent coming back at me saying, well, the universe may not have a purpose, but I do. And that's how he manages to get up in the morning. Now, as a scientist, though, there's something bothering me about that quote. Um, his reasons for this conclusion or is that the physical universe is cold, indifferent, and even hostile to life. Many of us today relived the landing on the moon by Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, and they were well prepared for the harsh environment of the moon. And that's what Dawkins is talking about, cold, indifferent, hostile to life. But here's the thing that bothers me. How does he know the universe lacks a purpose? Are purpose and evil testable? scientific concepts? The answer is, of course they are not. They are value judgments that we apply to things basically as a philosophical term. What Richard overlooks when he says this is that cold and harsh universe also contains the physical and chemical potential that makes life possible. So you could understand science exactly the same way that Richard Dawkins does, and if you were John Haught or Francis Collins, or Theodosius Dobzhansky or Francisco Ayala, you might look at the same facts, and instead of that, you might say this. The universe we observe through evolution has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, the wisdom of a provident and purposeful God intent upon a fruitful and dynamic world and committed to a promise of human freedom. That's not a scientific statement but it is every bit as valid as the statement that you just heard from Richard Dawkins. And I think that's something we have to keep in mind. 
Now, every now and then, one of my friends in the physical sciences said, well, whatever you might say about God and evolution, everything is being figured out in terms of cosmology. Uh, and in fact, uh, Stephen Hawking, in his very last book, The Grand Design, uh, basically said, look, we now know there are rules that allow universes to come spontaneously into existence. So the theologian's trump card, which is why is there something rather than nothing, no longer matters. We now know the reason there is something is the universe can blast itself into existence spontaneously. Now, so the bottom line is there are rules of nature that allow the spontaneous creation of multiple independent universes. Well, Hawking's writing in this book was a bit dense. So Lawrence Krauss, University of Arizona, formerly, uh, decided to popularize this in a book called The Universe from Nothing. And you can see the top why there is something rather than nothing. Uh, Richard Dawkins was so taken by this book that he begged Lawrence to let him write the afterwards. And here's what Dawkins wrote. If the origin of species was biology's death blow to supernaturalism, we may come to see the universe from nothing as the equivalent from cosmology. The title means exactly what it says, and what it says is devastating. We no longer need a creator to account for something as fundamental as the existence of the universe. Now it turns out that a number of reviewers tore this book apart, and not on religious grounds, on scientific grounds. This is David Albert from Columbia University, an atheist, I might add, who reviewed this book in the New York Times. And he noticed something. He pointed out that Krauss made a fundamental mistake. Neither quantum mechanics nor M theory, that's string theory, can account for the mechanisms that generate these multiple universes. So when we say the universe came from nothing, there have to be pre-existing quantum foam and other mechanisms to bring it into existence. And from his review, he wrote, where are the laws of quantum mechanics supposed to have come from? Krauss is more or less upfront, as it turns about, that he doesn't have a clue about that. He acknowledges this just before the end of the book, that he simply takes the basic principles of quantum mechanics for granted. That's not good enough. He has not done away with the need for a first cause, and it's non-theist writers who pointed that out right away. This was an insight voiced a few years ago by the very distinguished cosmologist Paul Davies. And Paul Davies used to like to torture his professors in graduate school in physics by asking them, where did the laws of physics come from? And apparently, any number of professors basically said, go away, kid, you bother me. Um, and others said, it's not our job to ask where the laws of physics come from. It's our job to discover them and work with them. To Davies, that wasn't good enough. And his insight was that something outside of nature is required to explain the laws of nature. And he pointed out that science has its own faith-based belief system. All science proceeds on the assumption that nature is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. Clearly then, both religion and science are founded on faith, namely on the belief of the existence of something outside the universe, like an unexplained god or an unexplained set of physical laws. And for that reason, neither provides a complete account of existence. So I want to go back to my friend David Barash and look at his column in the Times. And I'd like to like look at a few quotes from it. Evolution has demolished pillars of religious faith and undermined belief in an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God. And he says, evolution is an entirely natural and undirected process. Living things are indeed wonderfully complex, but altogether within the range of a statistically powerful mechanical phenomenon. That's an interesting statement. Is it a problem to point out that life was generated by purely natural processes? St. Augustine didn't think so. He wrote at the beginning of the fifth century that the universe was brought into being in a less than fully formed state, but was gifted to transform itself from unformed matter into a truly marvelous array of structures and life forms. And Augustine, needless to say, saw that as being perfectly consistent with creation. Let's take another quote. 
No literally supernatural trait has ever been found in Homo sapiens. We are perfectly good animals, natural as can be, indistinguishable from the rest of the living world at the level of structure and physiological mechanism. Indeed, we are. But is it a problem to think that we are an ordinary part of the natural world? I remember reading a book with, with this quotation in it once. Remember, man, thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Charles Darwin didn't write that book. Somebody else did. And it was a reflection of the physical nature of life. That's not a theological problem. Then he says the more we know of evolution, the more unavoidable the conclusion that living things, including us, were produced by a natural, totally amoral process with no indication of that benevolent, controlling creator. It is true that the theory of evolution does not require God as an explanation. However, I can ask another question. Why should nature be structured in such a way that it supports the extravagant creativity of the evolutionary process? Science has no answer to that why question, but people of faith may see that as the work of the very same creator. So my message to Professor Barash would be to skip the talk, focus on biology, and if his students truly understand the science, they will come to their own reconciliation. Now, am I saying, in saying this, that the Bible should be understood as a scientific textbook? And if you're not familiar with it, I want to read you a passage from an extraordinary book, once again by Augustine, written in 411 AD. It's called On the Literal Meaning of Genesis. And Augustine said, and you can see the quote up here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate Augustine's words into 21st century scientific language. So here we go. Even a non-believer can study geology, astronomy, zoology, and so forth, and this scientific knowledge he can gain empirically. Now the worst thing that could happen would be to, for a non-believer to hear a Christian presumably explaining the meaning of the Bible, talking nonsense on scientific topics. And we should take all means to prevent an embarrassing situation in which non-believers highlight the scientific ignorance of a Christian and ridicule our faith. I am absolutely convinced that if Augustine were alive today, he would be an evolutionist. Now, once I said this to a secular audience, and I got a person who stood up and said, what kind of science would we have if we followed the views of some weird 5th century mystic like Augustine? And knowing the scientific field that this particular guy was in, I decided I'd have a little fun. Um, and that is, you may know, sir, that there is a religious order founded according to the precepts of Augustine, the Augustinian author, uh, uh, the, 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 the Augustinian order. And I would like to point out that there was a person who basically was ordained in the Augustinian tradition, very religious man, was later on promoted to head of the religious group of which he was a member, and at one point he got interested in today what we would call a scientific question, which is how do plants pass their characteristics along to their offspring? Well, did he read the Bible? Yes, he did. He had to read it every day for the Roman office. But that's not where he looked for answers to this question. He looked in the garden and he did experiments. His name was Gregor Mendel, and he was the abbot of the Augustinian Monastery of St. Thomas in Brunn, in what is today the Czech Republic. Uh, the, so the answer to the question of what kind of science would we have today if we followed the precepts of St. Augustine is we'd have darn good science, we'd have genetics, because you're talking about the founder of the modern science of genetics itself. So my closing points today are these. And I highlight these, by the way, with a book that I hope will become better known. It's called The Sun in the Church. And it's a book that was written by David Heilbrunn a number of years ago. And it gets its title from Heilbrunn's observation that many ancient cathedrals in Europe had a dual function. Places of worship, they functioned as solar observatories. And there are often small holes cut way up in the ceiling and marks on the floor to enable solar observations so the exact time 
of the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox could be fixed. So these actually functioned as observatories. And his point was in the so-called Dark Ages, the church itself was the funding organization for science. So the church's broadly construed interest in science is longstanding. So my closing points are these, and that is that faith suffers to the extent that it rejects the gifts of understanding that could be provided by science. Science suffers by means of the deep hostility that many scientists show to any form of faith. And in reality, science and faith both arise from the same human need, which is the desire to understand. During the Kitzmiller trial in which I participated, a number of newspaper columns were written. I thought the most insightful one was written by Charles Krauthammer, the late Charles Krauthammer, a person of faith and perhaps the most conservative writer at the Washington Post. And here's his article. Phony theory, false conflict, intelligent design foolishly pits evolution against faith. And here's what Krauthammer wrote. How ridiculous to make evolution the enemy of God. What could be more elegant, more simple, more creative, indeed more divine than a planet with millions of life forms, distinct and yet interactive, all ultimately derived from accumulated variations in a single double-stranded molecule, pliable and fecund enough to give us mollusks and mice, Newton and Einstein, even if it also gave us the Kansas Board of Education. <laughs> my apologies to my friends from Kansas. Um, in summing up, I, I'm always searching for the right words to the, describe the way that I understand the role that evolution plays in our living world and the way I understand it both as a scientist and a person of faith. And I've never found quite the right words of my own. And therefore, I'm going to use the words of somebody else. And these words come from more than a century and a half ago. And the person who wrote these words is the person who made this sketch in a notebook. And a number of years ago, I was fortunate enough to hold this notebook in my own hands and look at that page. And it's, it just made me tremble. And you can see there's a sketch there. At the top of the page, it says, I think. And then in his very poor handwriting, this guy wrote at the bottom of the page what he meant by this. And then he came back, we know, a couple weeks later and put some more notes in the upper right-hand corner. It's very rare that you can open a scientist's note, scientist notebook and point to a page and say, right there on that page is one of the greatest discoveries of all time. But that's the page. And the person who wrote that notebook ended a famous book with, this word, with these words. He wrote, not that evolution was demeaning or degrading or anything like that. He said, there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most wonderful, and most beautiful have been and are being evolved. That's the concluding sentence of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, and I think those are words to live by. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. It's fascinating to hear from someone who is so close to the epicenter of this discussion between evolution and Christianity. Um, we are running slightly behind schedule, but uh, we have time for a few questions. So if you could come up with your questions to the microphones in the aisles, uh, we'll take a, two or three questions at this point. Hi, I, I heard you uh, speaking at Fermilab a few months ago. Oh, that, I, what a great visit. I, I uh, wish Fermilab's I would, extraordinary. Yeah, I wish I would have had formulated my question then, but I'd like to ask it now. So I'm a computer scientist, undergraduate in engineering. I accept common ancestry evolution. That's fine. 
However, the Darwinian mechanism doesn't make any sense as a computer program. I see a hugely complicated program in, in life. And making random changes to this is not kind of, I mean, it's powerful enough to make closely related species by devolving things, but not all of life, especially not original of life. And yet at Fermilab, you were equating belief in intelligent design, which I don't think is incompatible with evolution, with young earth creationists and anti-vaxxers. And I think that's a dirty trick. <laughs> Okay, so well, I'll, see what you say about that. Uh, well, first, uh, first of all, I don't think it's a dirty trick, and I'll explain why. Um, and I'll start with intelligent design, and then we'll talk about mechanism. I'll try to do it quickly. Um, one of the things that came out during the Kitzmiller trial was that um, this textbook, Pandas and People, was originally written as a creationist book. And after a Supreme Court decision, Edwards versus Aguilard, ruled that creation science, so-called, was impermissible in the public schools, what the publishers of that book did was, in effect, to do a Microsoft Word find and replace and change every reference to creator to designer. And it turned out it was very clear that the intelligent design label was essentially a subterfuge to sort of move the mention of the creator and creation to one side and replace it with a designer. And therefore, it was very clear that intelligent design was really a stalking horse for creationism. And furthermore, that the advocates of intelligent design had tried very hard not to be specific about the age of the Earth so as to bring young Earth creationists along with them. So therefore, that certainly is something that I think is in the, both the court record and also in our understanding of the intelligent design movement. In terms of mechanism, um, it's important to note that evolutionary theory didn't end in 1859. Um, and Darwin, Charles Darwin knew absolutely nothing of genetics. Mm -hmm. So when you mention random changes, it's important to appreciate that we understand today that evolution is driven by way more than simply point mutations. That there are, in fact, changes in transcription factors and others that affect whole suites of genes instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So therefore, one does not have to wait for the accumulation of these. We can have rapid genetic change. And there are any number of laboratory experiments, one of which a really classic experiment now has been done for more than 20 years by Richard Lenski at Michigan State University, in which he simply has grown cultures of E. coli and allowed them to evolve. One of the definitions of E. coli as a bacterium is that it's unable to metabolize citrate. And it turns out that after about 15 years, several of his cultures evolved the capacity to metabolize citrate, which is a big deal if you happen to be a bacterium, because it means all of a sudden you can grow in a different food source, and you are, in fact, a different species. So I think in terms of mechanism, we understand more and more of that mechanism all the time. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, therefore, I would stand in defense, not that we understand everything about the mechanism of evolution, but that we certainly uh, know enough to be able to say that the sorts of genetic changes that are required for the origin and diversification of species are well within the mechanism. We also understand that that mechanism couldn't have just arisen through natural, you know, it's way too complicated for to be able to have arisen through, through natural means. Okay, well you're, 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 you're asserting that the mechanism could not have arisen and I would submit your evidence for that is what Dawkins has called the argument from incredulity, which is I don't believe it and therefore it can't be true. But, but you're, you're raising, sir, you're raising a separate question, really, which is the origin of life. Yeah. And I would be among the first person to admit, and I've written this into my textbooks, that the origin of life is and remains a mystery. And we don't quite understand it. But once you get a self-replicating organism with genetics, you have the capacity for evolution. We have time for just one more question. We have a, a few other things we need to get to tonight. So um, uh, I think you were up here okay, first, sure. Fred, so go uh, ahead. So Ken, as a fellow expert witness, I want to think about when you were on the Dover case and you and so many were people of faith, presumably that came up in your expert witness that from your perspective, this wasn't you dishonoring God, if you please, as a person of faith. Uh, did that come up in the uh, expert witnessing? Uh, presumably the reporters heard it, and it sounds like at least a number of them 
disregarded that, and how did that make you feel? Well, a, a couple of things. One is, um, I didn't have to do the theological heavy lifting because one of our expert witnesses was in fact a professor of theology. Um, and John Hort did a, a marvelous job answering those questions. The questions that I was asked, where I was asked, were basically whether the textbooks that I had co-authored were fundamentally anti-theological in terms of um, uh, there being no mention of God in my high school or college biology textbooks. And my answer to that on the stand was, well, open a chemistry textbook, open an algebra textbook. You won't see mention of God in there either. Um, but uh, when I was cross-examined on the table of the attorneys for the school board, they had a copy of Finding Darwin's God. Uh, and they read a few quotations from it, and I tried to explain to them um, that properly understood, evolution of the biological sciences are not theistic, nor are they atheistic, but like all science, they are non-theistic. And this allows a person of faith to understand science as being compatible with their faith, and that includes evolution. Let's thank Dr. Miller one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much.